Hey y'all, it's Farley from Rider's Edge Podcast. And today we're gonna talk about what drives me cribbin crazy. let's have a conversation today about cribbing. What I'm talking about is when a horse latches onto a piece of wood with its teeth and sucks air. Some people refer to this as when sucking, some people call it cribbing, some people call it crib biting. If you're like me and you're from the south, you call it cribbing because down here we chop off the G's off every word we can. We make our vowels a lot longer and draw out as many words as possible. So, let's talk about cribbin. Cribbin is something that is a little bit of a faux pas. It's often not talked about in horse circles. People often try to um, keep it on the down low. But I thought, you know what? Let's see what's going on. And uh, I'll just be real honest with you. I've got a couple in the barn right now that are cribbers. And uh, I thought, let's, let's look at what the literature says let's see what people are talking about online and see if there's anything new out there that might make me a little less crazy <laughs> so i will give you the end of this conversation here at the beginning i found no new earth shattering information about how to curb cribbing so if you're sitting there and going, well, Farls, it's going to be a real short podcast. Hang on. Hang with me. I did find some things that were interesting, but I found nothing new and earth shattering. So there is no cure for cribbing. There's been a lot of debate online about why horses crib. For a long time, it was thought of they get a high from it. They get a big endorphin release from it. They get a high from it. They have done studies now, and they really are more firmly believing that it is a stress reliever. They have studied cortisol levels in horses at crib. They have studied this level in horses at crib, and in this study, they allowed those horses part of the group of horses to crib and part of them they were restricted and they found the horses that were cribbers that were restricted from cribbing had higher cortisol levels and I found other conversations in blog articles by veterinarians and different things like that and essentially from that search uh, I feel like cribbing is it's it's just a stress reaction and some horses are more prone to that than others. I don't, I, I relate it to people who bite their nails or pull their hangnails or different things like that. It's some personalities and people are higher strung. And it's the same thing with their horses. If you've had several different horses, uh, you know you have several different personalities and different coping mechanisms. So within all that to say, a lot of the talk on cribbing and how to manage it was to let it happen. If the horse is safe, if the horse is an easy keeper, don't restrict them and just put up with the very annoying habit. Now it can um, wreak havoc on your barn, but depending upon how your barn is structured or things like that, why worry about restricting that activity for these horses? Because when you get, when you do get people together to talk about how they uh, curb the behavior, people have different opinions about different collars and different methods, and it's just, it, it's like I said at the beginning, there's no cure for it. Some people have better luck with one structure or another, but across the board, you really can't point to, oh, this really works. 
Another thing that I found in my search was the question, is cribbing a learned behavior? And with everything else, there was no clear-cut answer on this. The people who were asking this question and discussing this question believed that it was not a learned behavior. However, I tend to disagree with that. I feel like if a horse personality-wise, genetic-wise, is more predisposed to having stress and higher anxiety, then they can learn that behavior from another horse in the barn. I say that because one of our cribbers is in his 20s, and he has cribbed for, and he's in his mid-20s, I think, now. I, boy, age is not kind, and it comes real fast. Um, but... Uh, We've had years where he's the only horse that cribs in the barn and none of the horses next to him do that. And then we've had other years where new horses are introduced into the barn and a couple months later they crib also. And now, who's to say if our old horse wasn't there, if they would have figured it out or not. But it makes me raise my eyebrow that if you have a horse that is, doesn't deal with stress very well, and his buddy shows him a cool new way to deal with it. He might pick up that habit too. <laughs> because the horse that drives me crazy right now wasn't stalled next to this one when he learned how to do it. Doesn't I? He hurt him because you can hear this horse throughout the barn. But um, he wasn't right next to him when he learned how to do it. Now cribbing can become an issue on horses that uh, do not hold their weight, are not easy keepers, who, uh, this is where this becomes a serious issue, more serious than barn structure repair. Horses that would rather crib than eat, that gets in the way of them taking in food or keeping weight on, and so that's when it becomes a much more serious problem. And collars, uh, muzzle type baskets, different things like that may need to be used or and more seriously uh, worked on to curb that behavior. There were a couple studies done to try to see the correlation between cribbing and ulcers. And there was nothing really conclusive there. Theme of the day, nothing really conclusive because everything was all over the board. Essentially, within all this, they found that there were horses that cribbed that had ulcers. There were horses that cribbed that didn't have ulcers. There were horses that didn't crib that had ulcers. There were horses that didn't crib that didn't have ulcers. So, again, to me, this goes back to this behavior is a stress and anxiety issue and I very much uh, have some uh, soapbox type feelings towards the word anxiety but I will uh, not climb up on my soapbox and I will leave my ladder in the closet and spare you my anxiety soapbox today. So I think cribbing and ulcers we do know are both stressors to how we maintain performance horses in this day and age, how they are not, how they are stalled and not allowed to do some of their more natural tendencies, natural behaviors. And so I think this continues to feed into the overall evidence of cribbing is a stress behavior. Along with horses who don't keep their weight on well when they are cribbers, sometimes those horses are more prone to colic that their stomach fills up with air or different things happen to perpetuate an easier time to colic and again in those cases just long of just like keeping weight on a horse is those cases are where you need to uh, monitor and try to curb their cribbing behavior more. There's a lot of C words going around today, so we'll see, or C sounding words, because um, our 
Our next bit of awesome information about cribbing has to do with selenium, which is not a C word, but it kind of goes in the same sound there. Uh, enough for a girl who was not hooked on phonics to say that it does. However, they did find that there is possibly <laughs> a relationship between cribbing and selenium. They found that horses in this study that were cribbers had a selenium deficiency. Now, selenium is a trace mineral, and I will caution you before you run out and act like a horse person who has a cribber and says, well, my horse must have a selenium deficiency. I'm going to throw whatever selenium at them. Whoa. Stop. Slow your roll. If you are not well educated in nutrition, get some help. Ask your vet, ask a nutritionist to help you with your ration. Because in the horse nutrition industry, all rations are very well rounded. They are, they are hard to, they are hard to screw up if you follow the directions. <laughs> I recognize that that is a big if there. Now, there are some parts of the country where there is less selenium and those horses can develop a deficiency. There are other parts of the country where that is not a problem. Selenium is found in the soil and in other places. And the reason why I caution you in getting more educated on this if you find that this is a problem for your horse is that you can cause selenium toxicity in your horse if you take it too far and it's a pretty small window in getting your horse up to an efficient level and feeding them too much horses need 0.1 milligrams per kilogram of selenium in their daily diet and more than two milligrams per kilogram is toxic. Now 0.1 to 0.1 milligrams to two milligrams can be kind of a big range, but it's really not. That's why I caution you if that is a problem seek some help, seek some guidance if that is not your forte on changing your ration up because it can become an issue very quickly. When they did this study, they were actually looking at other trace, a lot of different trace minerals and this is the one that really popped out as being deficient. So I thought that was kind of interesting and something well worth the time to talk about here today on Rider's Edge. Throughout all my research, the theme kept coming up, management. How do you manage these horses? They need to be managed more like horses. We talk a lot about that when managing ulcers. We talk a lot about this when managing performance horses at all. And the standard things still happen. The more turnout time, the better. Being in a herd, being in a group, that is better for their mental, physical, emotional health. Um, you know, making sure they have a balanced diet, that uh, feeding more forage and less concentrate. And just standard things that we talk about all the time. Horses at crib, in my experience, and I feel like this is pretty well across the board, tend to have a higher oral tendency, right? They tend to be lippier, mouthier. They may not be biters, but they like that kind of oral fixation. They may chew on the lead rope, put it in their mouth, whatever. So another management tool to kind of think about is stimulating that oral fixation without allowing them to crib. And some of those suggestions were, you know, some of the toys 
uh, licks, salt licks, or even just the kind of treat licks that you can put up. And even getting some of the slow hay feeder, whether it's over the bale or they make, uh, I found these the other day that I'm going to try at my barn. And they're just little, they look like little kickballs, right? Um, with a little slow feeder, hay feeder uh, holes in them that you put the hay in and they have to pull it out. And so um, for my horse that is um, driving me crazy, I'm going to throw a bunch of these out in the lot for him because he is managed this way. He can come and go as he pleases. He's got a big turnout area. And I'm hoping that if I throw a bunch of these out that we can kind of play hide and seek with hay all day and keep him a little more stimulated that way. I'll let you know if it works. If you have some very creative ways that you have managed your cribbers, let me know. Send me an email at writersedgetherapy at gmail.com or hit me up on the Facebook because I would be very interested to hear what you have to say about managing horses at crib. It's, it's only, a, it's an annoyance. It's only a problem if you're having a uh, weight management problem or a colicking problem. It's a nuisance on your structures and your barn but on the whole, in our barn, we've allowed these horses to continue to do that. Now, that kind of goes back to the faux pas thing of, I don't, I'm not going to talk about this. This is, this is a little bit like Fight Club. We don't talk about cribbing. And it can be an issue in the horse industry when it comes time to sell because it's very frowned upon. There's a lot of people that don't like to manage it. But my feelings about it is if the horse is an athlete and is performing at a high level, they all have their own idiosyncrasies that we have to manage. And it may not be cribbing with one of them. It may be something with something else. So if it's a horse that is performing and doing its job well, it just sometimes it just comes with the territory. Now other times it's just an nuisance and it's a problem and hopefully some we get some conversation going on other management techniques for that people have tried and had success with but on the whole it's a it's a it's a stress coping behavior i feel like with these horses and um, if you can prevent it from happening then as you well know uh, prevention what's that cliche something it's Prevention's worth more than the cure or something. I'm, it's escaping me right now. But if you can prevent it, then it's just never a problem. The thing about that is, is that we don't have a crystal ball to see if this horse is more prone to that. When they tried to study different breeds on cribbing, they found in their study that thoroughbreds were, were pardon me, were more susceptible to cribbing than warm bloods or quarter horses. However, the researchers attributed that to the stereotypical way thoroughbreds are handled, right? Most thoroughbreds are at the track. As we well know, track horses are managed <laughs> very differently than horses in their natural state. And that's where, you know, a lot of these stress behaviors are looked at first so they couldn't really contribute that to a genetic thing it was more they still went back to more of a management thing because if you look at thoroughbreds versus quarter horses on the whole thoroughbreds are stereotypically handled more the same way where quarter horses are a very more versatile diverse breed that are handled in a multitude of different ways where high performance horses are still managed in a more natural environment and high performance horses are managed in a closer to a track environment or a track environment. So just things to think about. So I hope this enlightened you 
on a few things you may not have thought about with cribbing and enlightened you to maybe check on a few things. If you have anything to enlighten me about, like I said, hit me up, send me, send me a message. I would love to hear from you. I hope you have enjoyed our conversation and time today. As always, I thank you for joining in and I will see you down the road. Thank you for listening to the Rider's Edge podcast today. We appreciate your time and attention. Thank you for always helping us move the conversation forward. If you liked today's podcast, please help us keep the conversations going by subscribing to this podcast and consider leaving us a review so others can find us and join in on the conversations. You can also find more information by checking us out on our social media channels, including Facebook at Rider's Edge Therapy and Wellness, Instagram at Rider's Edge Therapy, and our website, www.ridersedgetherapy.com. It is there that you can book a consult for either you or your horse. Thank you, and as always, we will see you down the road.